Awesome. Good morning. Woo. Good to see you guys. I am so excited about today. I know I get up here every week and say I'm so excited, but I mean it. I promise. Today is going to be awesome. And by awesome, I mean it's a doozy. Okay? All right? So let me show you what I'm talking about here. Let me have my volunteers come up. They got some vol. Oh, yeah, a whole row of them. Awesome. You guys just be right down here, okay, in a little arc. Today we're going to talk about resetting our hands, okay? Resetting our hands to be used by Jesus, to serve not ourselves, but to serve others, okay? Now, this is easy. This is e- we can all do this, okay? So what we're going to do, I'm going to show you. This is like what we got going on in our normal day. It's no problem. And when you have reset hands, Jesus comes along and says, I'm going to give you one more thing to do. And we're like, okay, it's no problem. Now, we practiced this earlier, okay, right? Here's what we're going to do. Guys, I'm going to be juggling this. You add your balls in right here, okay, right at the top of the arc. Not here, not here, not here, okay? We, I had to clarify that when we ran through this earlier, okay? All right? So my record is seven, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, boy. Okay. All right, we can do this. You guys with me? Three, two, one. Throw it at the top. Go. Okay. Okay. Yep. And that's exactly how we feel when God says, can I give you one more thing? Right? Let's be honest. You guys can have a seat. Good job. We'll get these balls later. This is what, yeah, give him a hand, Archie. You love it. Wow. You guys are very easy to impress. You just watch the guy drop eight balls. That's awesome. We come with our hands already full. We're juggling this. This is life. We're like, man, I can't, I can't do one more thing, God. And I'm hearing your words say we need to serve others, and my hands are full. And if I take on one more thing to juggle, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to be one of those people just like, you know, forget it. I'm out. I can't do it. We're spinning the plates as fast as we can, and we got this one, and we go over here. Just as soon as we get this one, that one crashes, right? You know what I'm talking about? Life is full. And so we hear this admonition that I'm supposed to serve others too. I'm supposed to get into their mess take on their problems, their issues. Are you kidding me? Do you know how messy people are? How messy life is? Man, pastor, that's hard. I mean, let's be honest. We got enough on our own plate. We got more than we can get to. So that's why we're going to look at this today. What does it mean when Jesus says, hey, I've reset your heart. Two weeks ago, he reset our minds. Last week, he reset our mouths and our tongue. In fact, we stayed there two weeks because a lot of you were coming up saying, oh, pastor, would you quit preaching to me? Believe me, it's for everybody. Today, we reset our, our hands. This is where it really comes alive for us as followers, as disciples of Jesus. Those who claim his name, what does it mean when Jesus has our actions, when he controls that, when we surrender? What things can we do in his name? That's what we're looking at. What does a service-filled life really look like in modern-day America? Not some historical thing. Not something back 2,000 years ago when there wasn't the internet and there wasn't so much stuff to do and we didn't have soccer games all the time and things like that, right? What about today? How does that mean? So if you're ready to find the answer, turn with me to Galatians 5. Galatians 5, while you do that, I'm going to welcome those who are streaming with us today, those who are joining us online. It is good to have you. Galatians chapter 5. While you get there, let me give you a little context of what's happening here. Paul is writing this to the church in Galatia. And these first two chapters of Galatians... He's saying, guys, I want to share with you something different here. I've come to this whole realization that faith is not by works anymore. Faith comes by hearing and believing in Jesus. We don't earn it. There's nothing we can do. It's not of good works, so we can't brag about it. We can't boast about it. And he's saying, it's not that we're, we, we aren't supposed to do good things. It's just that doing the good things isn't what saves us. We're not saved because of our good works. We're saved, and then we go do good works. We go be salt. We go be light. That's what he's saying in the first two chapters, because that was kind of foreign to them. They're not used, this is kind of a revolutionary thing. What do you mean we're not supposed to be doing all these things? You know, well, you can do them, but that's not why we're doing it for our own righteousness. Then he goes on in chapters three, four, five, even into six, and he says, okay, now you're saved. Now what? It's the so what of walking with Jesus. What do you do now? I get the faith thing, but you know, I mean, what's the daily nitty-gritty of what I'm supposed to do, and he addresses that, and that's where we join this conversation already in progress. Read with me, starting in verse 13. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Yeah, buddy, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Woo! (laughs) Rather, here it is, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor 
as yourself. If you bite and you devour each other, man, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. And there it is. We are not saved to sit. We are saved to serve. We are saved to go out. Now, notice one of these things he says here. He says, loving and serving others sums up the whole law. Now, notice these incredibly graphic words that Paul uses. He uses these words here, bite and devour. Can you believe this? Bite and devour. Do you know what the original language says? The Greek is saying, this is what you will become. You will become like ravenous animals attacking each other. Ravenous wolves coming and devouring and biting and trying to kill each other if you're not busy serving. All right, I'm going to go there. Y'all know someone who's a busybody? Doesn't have enough to do? They're not serving God, but boy, they are the first ones to complain about things going wrong in the world or in your home or at work or at your church. You know what I'm talking about? You know why? Because they're not busy serving. They're not the one. And this is the warning for us. Man, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. If you're, nah, 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 you're always negative, always complaining. Well, he didn't do that. Why is she doing that? Da, da, da. Paul himself is giving a warning. Guys, don't fall into the trap. This is what happens, all right? So the first question we should all be asking and be thinking right now, what specifically is this freedom for? Why do we have this? And why would anyone, let's be honest, why would anyone want to go through all the trouble of serving our neighbor? I mean, isn't that kind of hard? Who wants to be a servant? Yeah, I get Jesus came, and he wanted to be a servant, not to be served, but to serve, and that was awesome, but he was God. Oh, wait, that's right, we're supposed to be like him. <laughs> Keep forgetting that part. Here's the thing. It's a great question to ask because Paul sets this up beautifully, almost like a bait and switch. He says these exciting announcing words, you are called to be free. And just when you're excited, you're like, yeah, that's right, freedom. Woo, chains are broken. My chains are gone. I miss it. Right? And we go running off. And it's almost like Paul goes, oh, hi, hang on. Wait, <laughs> time out. I, I forgot one thing. There's a disclaimer. I meant to tell you that freedom, it's yours, but it's... <sighs> It's not for you alone. It's to serve others. Sorry. You know, he has this bizarre, on one hand, go, be free, go, serve God. And then he says, oh, but you know what? Don't use that freedom just for selfish indulgences. Don't take advantage of it like that. You use that to serve others, to those who are still in chains. That's who you're supposed to go. We're freed up to go love them. We're freed up to go serve them. We're free to care for them. We're free to give. He says, don't use your freedom as an excuse for self-indulgence. Don't do that. Instead, use it to humbly serve and love one another. Which brings us to another question. How do we know if we're being self-indulgent? How do we know if we're indulging in the flesh? Well, Paul is glad you asked, because apparently they asked back then too, because he goes on and he answers that in the very next few verses. Read it with me. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Whew, thank you, Lord. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Get ready. Here comes a list. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Whew, I warn you, as I did before, this is a re-warning for him, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Wow, what a list. <laughs> I can't wait to break this down. I want you all to notice... Um, there's a word in here at the very beginning of this passage, and it says walk. Walk in the Spirit. Most people miss this. The original Greek here, it is not walk like you and I think. It's not like, do, 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 I walk, I'm saved, great. No, no, this is an ongoing, active walking. It means we are to walk every day toward progressing in holiness like Jesus. Every day, our goal is to get up and say, Lord, reset my feet, my mind, my tongue, my heart, my hands. I am going to walk towards you in holiness. It is an ongoing walking, meaning you never arrive till you are glorified, okay? It's, it's not a one-time thing. This is a growing progress. When we daily submit to the Holy Spirit's control, you will not gratify these desires of the flesh. There's no way these could coexist. If you are reading your word, if you're meeting with fellow like-minded believers who are hungry for God and you're submitting to him every day, you don't have to worry about some of these words in here. These are crazy. 
Who does these things? This is not, by the way, an exhaustive list. This is just a tiny little summary, a catalog of sins that Paul was dealing with back in Galatia. Okay? Here's the good news. None of those sins are still practiced today in America. Right? We are off the hook, right? And, that is, and you feel good. Wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I had that wrong. Sorry. All of these sins we practice here in America. We look at this. Let me show you how the average person reacts to a list. Just being honest, it's the potter's hand, right? You're allowed to take your mask off. We all messed up, okay? So let's just walk through these. This is what we do. We look, we look at this list and we start checking them off. Sexual morality, impurity, debauchery. Nope, I'm good. Idolatry and witchcraft. Goodness, no. I'm good there. Hatred, discord, jealousy. No, no. Unless... Maybe I check my Facebook and I see somebody's got something better. But we'll go on. Fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. No, goodness, no. I don't even know what factions means. And you go on. Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Are you kidding me? Who's got time for that? And you go on and on. And you think, oh, I'm pretty good. We checked all those off. I cleared that bar, right? That's our knee-jerk reaction. And we all do it. Until that Holy Spirit whispers, oh, like he does. And he says, hey, <laughs> you missed one. <laughs> Maybe more than one, but you missed one. Go back and read the list again and see if the one that you think is the most innocuous, the most simple, is maybe the one you're stumbling over. Do you want to know what one sin, one item on this list trips most Americans up in our Americanized gospel? You want to know what it is? It's going to shock you. Are you ready for this? Do, 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 do. Selfish ambition. You see, we're okay. We're, we're the heavy hitters, witchcraft, <laughs> idolatry, orgies. Are you kidding? By the way, mom and dad, it is up to you to define these words at home today. Okay, that is, that is on you, and you're welcome. Okay, this, <laughs> you're welcome. We're just gonna moving right along here because some of these words are just kind of really really fun, you know? And we look at, and I'm not saying fun with any of these, hear me, I'm just saying these words are bizarre, so you can define them as you wish as you get home. Selfish ambition, the problem with this one, this is so innocuous, it's, it's so subtle, you don't even know it's happening. I'm going to share with you some ways that this, this is the one that stops us from submitting our hands under the Lordship of Christ, because it is so hard to spot. You know what selfish ambition means? It means putting myself before you. It means the desire to have things my way. Oh, well, you know, that's not too bad. Isn't there a famous restaurant chain that says you can have it your way? I mean, how bad can it be? Does it, well, let me, let me go through it. But before I do, I need to ask your permission. Can I be honest with you in this next five minutes? Paint, nod your head if I can. Okay. Can I be brutally honest with you? Can I add the brutal to it? No, I don't. Okay, all right, okay. I'll, I'll try to draw the line here. here. Here's the deal. When we look at this list and we come back and it comes back and that small whisper says, Psst, selfish ambition is your stumbling block, here is what it means in a modern day America, how we do not use our reset hands. There are three C's I want to leave you with today. Three C's that come in the way of us serving our brothers, serving our sisters like Christ calls us to. The first one is convenience. Oh. No, don't go there. Pastor, what if helping that person in need disrupts my schedule? Don't you know I have a routine? Don't you know that, look, I, I understand, but if I go do this, if I feel you leading me, to, I'm going to have to get up off the sofa on Sunday afternoon during the game. Don't you know that it's time for the Patriots to lose? Don't you know, Lord, that it is time? I've got to watch the, see what I'm saying? This is, this is the convenience. You're amen in the Patriots losing, aren't you? I can tell. All right. Sunday afternoon, I can't, I gotta, I can't, and you're saying if I do this, I'm going to have to drive all the way across town in my air-conditioned car with leather seats. I, it's so hard. Don't call me to be that. I know, I know you died on a cross, and I know you were whipped and beaten within an inch of your life before you were even up there, but that, that's hard. I can't get in my comfortable car and drive across town. That's going to take seven minutes. That's, that's convenience, folks. That's convenience. We laugh <laughs> because it stings just a wee bit. 
You know what the second C word is? Comfort. Oh, <laughs> I can't wait. This is, oh, this is going to spank. Okay. <laughs> Pastor, are you telling me I'm going to be physically disrupted now too? Are you seriously saying that I know that single mom neighbor across the street needs help shoveling her snow? I know she does, but it's so cold. I can't, I can't do that. Pastor, I know that that guy needs help moving that heavy furniture, that Ikea furniture that Jason and Courtney have that's from the devil. That stuff is so heavy. <laughs> you look up Ikea in the dictionary, it's got a picture of Satan. I'm serious. It is, it is so heavy. I know that guy needs help moving that furniture, but it's so heavy. I can't do that. And I know my friend's wife's in the hospital. She's got no family here and hardly any friends except for a few of us who claim to be her friends. I know we should go visit them, but have you been to a hospital? <laughs> Pastor, hospitals are blah, icky. They are so, and that's a technical term for germ infested. <laughs> and that's how we feel, right? We slather on that after we get out. Like, don't touch me. I'm still drying. I just, I just got this antibacterial stuff and I got a full shower. They did it as I left and I think I'm clean, Right? right? I kid because I care. I'm telling you, this is, this, is, this is what we deal with. That is comfort. Don't ask me to do that, Lord. This is how it surfaces in our life. Just being real. Go on to the third C. Take a deep breath. Cost. I'm going to pull that little grenade and just leave that right there. Boom. Cost. If I help that family with groceries this week, Pastor, I know they have young kids and I know they are struggling to just put food on the table. But just between me and you, Lord, if I help them with that, do my wife and I still get to go see a movie this weekend? Because that's kind of important. I heard there's this awesome family movie coming out, something about Shades of Grey or something. I can't wait to go see that. It's going to be, huh? Oh. Y'all, if I find out any of us are supporting that, oh, we're better than that, y'all. Raise the standard. Pastor, if I... If I go do this, if I invest a portion of my income to meeting someone's needs, if I'm radically investing, like you called us, Lord, to invest in someone else, to put them first, does that mean I'm going to have trouble affording that $787 car payment? Because <laughs> that new car has been calling my name. It's got the wood grade steering wheel, and it smells so good. Just You can smell it right now. Because, Pastor, I might have to drive a, a five-year-old car just so I free up some money that you've given me anyway to meet somebody's needs or to support that missionary who is desperately trying to get back to Ghana. And if I do that, because the, what will my neighbors think? They'll think, oh, he can't afford a new car because I can. I totally can. I'm just choosing not to because I'm spiritual now and I'm going to help someone else. Because, Pastor, if you're calling me to do that, that cost is high. And I don't know if I can do that. Do you see how the excuses from the enemy are endless? of how he will come and try to put the chains back on you to stop you from loving and serving like Christ. This is how it happens. It happens in such subtle ways. How about this? Pastor, if I do it, let's just say I do it. Let's just say I buy in. I'm going to try this whole gospel thing out. Okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to serve others. And I give my blood, my sweat, my tears, my time, and no one notices. What if nobody thanks me? Surely there's a thank you card coming in the mail sometime, right? Because that's in Second hesitation somewhere. It's in the Bible, isn't it? I think it's, no, it's not, it's not in there because that's not why we serve. It's not why we do it. We don't do it for the recognition. Pastor, you don't understand. I'm just not good at fill in the blank. Pastor, I'm not good with my hands. Believe me, I've used this, y'all. I was born with two left hands. I can't build nothing. And I have all these great projects I want to do. And I'm just like, you know, it's just one of those things that I've said this. Pastor, I'm just not good at that. Or here's this one. Pastor, I'm an introvert. <laughs> I can't get around people. Have you been around people? People are so weird. <laughs> people are so messy. Yeah, they are. So are you. So am I. When you serve somebody and you get down into their ick and you are trying to help them out of that miry clay, it gets messy. And that's living. It's okay. Jesus got messy when he came and showed us the example. And this is radical stuff. You don't hear this anymore. You don't hear it in our country because we're fat, happy, blessed, and content. I don't need to serve. Are you kidding? Man, I got it all. 
And to a large degree, we do, except for the main thing. And Jesus comes and he says, don't, don't, don't give me the cop out. You said you surrendered your heart. Now, did you? You want to surrender your hands? Because I'll take them. I will use them in ways that will blow your mind. But only you can surrender them. So we, we, we cop out. Oh, Pastor, somebody else will do it. Look, look around you, man. We've used the overflow chairs on both sides of this room today. This church is growing. We're not a tiny church anymore. Somebody else will take up the slack. Man, that is an easy thing to say. I've said that. Thankfully, the Bible is very clear about this. How do we stop selfish ambition? You see how subtle it is? Check out what he says in Philippians. Look at this verse. Do nothing, nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility you are to esteem others above yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Which leads us to question number two. How do we do this? I'm with you so far, Pastor, but how do we do this? Now that we know our freedom in Christ empowers us to serve others and love others, who exactly are you talking about? Who exactly is my neighbor? Remember that one? Oh, yes, the one coming up to trip Jesus up. Um, Rabbi, smart man, which you are, of course, no one would dispute that. Who exactly is my neighbor? <laughs> Buffy, right? And he goes up and he does that. And he's like, and Jesus, in typical Jesus fashion, blows him out of the water with a parable. The parable of the Good Samaritan. That whole thing comes back to say one thing. You know who your neighbor is, smart guy? It's anyone in need. That's who your neighbor is. Anyone you come across that's in need, that just defines them as your neighbor. Need defines neighbor. Do we get that? When we come across somebody in need, that's what gives them that neighbor status. So here's your challenge. Here's your goal. Are you ready for this? When you discover someone in need, as often as you can and you have the power to beat the need, meet it. Meet the need. It's not rocket surgery, right? You can look at this and say, here's somebody who's in need. I should meet this need. Now, listen, before you get overwhelmed, because I know it's easy to think this, before you get overwhelmed, think, Pastor, come on, look around. Everybody's in need, right? Everybody's in need. We get it. I'm overwhelmed. I can't do it all, so I'm not going to do anything. Before you feel that way, and I understand, I've been there, here is the secret escape hatch. Are you ready for this? Not everyone you meet that has a need is your need to meet, okay? Hear me say that. Not everyone you run across. Not everything is yours to do. Not everything is mine to do, okay? So how do you know the difference? As you set about this new, deeper journey that we have embarked on to reset everything in total surrender, as you come to this new, deeper faith walk with him to live an other-centered life, here's what I want you to do when you encounter a need. Are you ready for this? This is revolutionary. And I'm going to say it, and you're going to think it's so simple, it's going to go right over your head, and you're going to miss it. I'm going to give you a warning. When you come across a need, immediately stop and do this. Release a breath prayer. You know what a breath prayer is? It's a prayer that can be uttered. It's so short, it can be uttered in one exhalation. One, ah. You know what the breath prayer you pray is? Simply this. Jesus, is this my need to meet? That's it. Don't complicate it. We have the privilege to ask our Father, the one who gives us wisdom. If you lack wisdom, ask him for it. Jesus, have you brought this in front of me to meet this need? I need to know right now. Here's what you do. You pray that breath prayer. It's simple. It's, don't complicate it. We love to make things complicated. I'm going to form a committee, and we are going to look into this lady's need. 17 weeks from now, we will come to a resolution if we should feed her. Well, she's dead in three weeks, okay? So we're not going to do a committee. You get to go straight to the Father, and you get to say, is this my need to me? Did you bring this to me? Here's what you do, okay? After you've prayed that prayer, wait a few seconds and listen for his reply. Listen for the Holy Spirit. If you feel that tug of the Holy Spirit whisper to confirm, yes, indeed, this is your need to selflessly meet, if you sense that, then that is probably the clear yes from the Spirit. If you sense that, buddy, you plow ahead with boldness and with generosity and with faithfulness, knowing God is proud, okay? Here's the other side. If you don't, just so that there's no guilt here, if you don't, move on. That's okay. You know why? 
because you did something deep that you probably haven't been actively doing. At least you gave the Lord a chance to speak to you about a need. Imagine what a different world we would have if we just committed to do that. If we came across a need every time and said, Jesus, is this my need to meet? Is this, is this for me? Did you put, is this my divine appointment? You know what? Honey, I'm feeling this. I'm feeling this. That I should do this. Needs are everywhere. You will find them in the craziest location. I was driving home, and there was a truck on the side of the road. I think, Ryan, do we have a picture of that truck? I think we have a picture. Yeah, right here. Okay. Now, kids, who is this? Mater. Well, that was not a kid, but okay. I, I'm with you. I know who Mater is. Just making sure the young ones are with me. Do we have another picture of it? Yes. Okay. Here's the real pic. I'm driving home, and I see this poor guy on the side of the road. He's got his gas tan out, and I'm like, oh, this is it. This is my need to meet. And I pull in, and I go up. He's got his head under the hood, and I join him because I know a lot about cars. <laughs> Why are you laughing at that? And I'm, I'm looking at the hood, and I look at him. He looks at me, and I look down at the hood. And we look back, and I'm like, I got nothing. I got nothing. And he says, I think I'm just out of gas. Do you think you're out of gas? Because there's a gas station right there, and I think I've got my wallet. You know what? All I have is a 20, but it's yours. If you can take the, I will even drive you. No, no, I'm good, I'm good. Thank you so much, brother. Give him a big hug. He goes off, fills up his gas can. He's able to go away. And I feel blessed. He feels blessed. Life is good. I go get Amy. Three hours later, I'm driving down the road. I'm talking with Amy. And I said, uh, excuse me, I'm so sorry. This poor guy, I come across the same truck with the same gas can out front and the same guy staring confused at his engine. And I said, Amy, this poor guy ran out of gas again in the same truck on the same road in the same day. This guy is having a bad day. And I get ready to pull in. She's like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? So I'm going to give him one of your 20s. <laughs> she said, um, you, you don't seriously think that he ran out of gas twice on the same street, like within 100 yards of where you filled up his tank last time, right? Well, no, I mean, that would mean he's, oh, are you, did, oh, nobody does that. Do he, here's the deal, y'all. I met a need that I felt good about, and I was innocent before the Father. What he does, that's on him. He will answer for that. That's up to him. We may get taken advantage of when we meet a need. And you know what? That's okay. You won't stand before the Lord for that. But you will if needs come your way and we keep rejecting them and we keep saying, I'm too busy. Can't do it. Needs are everywhere. Are you open? Will you pray? Will you take that challenge and say, you know what, Jesus, is this my need to meet? Wait for him, okay? And then go with the divine guidance that you get. We, as his children, have that wonderful privilege. Don't neglect it. So now we know why we're called to love. We know who we're called to love. And it all leads to the final question. How? How do we do this? How are we to love? Well, Galatians has the answer. Surprise, surprise. Galatians 5.14 says this. How do you love? The same way you love yourself. All right, pastor, I, I get that. I've heard that. We all know that. Just between us, just a little conversation. What does that really mean? <laughs> can you break that down for us? Yes, I can. Love your neighbor with the same urgency that you love yourself. Love your neighbor with the same passion, with the same intensity, with the same sense of protection as you love and direct at yourself. Let me get even more practical. When our livelihood is threatened, buddy, we bow up. We take action, right? We immediately search to resolve that situation. When our safety is being threatened, what do we do? Man, we react strongly. We bow up and we go rise up. We go do something about it. Do the same for your neighbor, for that unspoken person who has no voice, who can't speak up. When our rights are threatened, we speak up. Do that for them. When our safety is being threatened, man, we push back. Do that for them. When we have our family and it's starting to be threatened, man, you take action. Help defend the defenseless. That's what Jesus did. Man, he was under the bridge. 
He was meeting with those people. He was meeting these needs. God's word is telling us simply how you do it, how you want it done for yourself. Man, do that for them. Do the same for them as you would do for yourself. There it is. There's the service creed in a sentence. Love well, serve well. Let God's spirit flow freely through you to bless others. Oh, did I mention there's another list? You ready? Do you like that last one with some big words in it? Here's the good part. This next list is the good stuff. It's the stuff you're supposed to have. It's not the stuff you're supposed to ignore and the stuff you don't want to deal with. It is found in Galatians 5.22, and it says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, man, there's no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Paul is saying, if you live this way, this is what you bear, and your life will be so full of satisfaction. It will be a satisfaction-rich life when you serve others. Let me show you what this service-oriented life looks like, okay? What this reset of the hands really looks like, okay? When you sell out to Jesus, your world changes. And what we end up with is something quite extraordinary. It's not a dead body under here. It's nothing, nothing to be too scared of. What happens is your whole paradigm changes. Let me show you what I mean. Let's make sure this fan doesn't blow that off too early. I have here almost a teasing. This is, this is a, what do they call this, fun size M&Ms? There's nothing fun about this. This, is, this should not be called, this should be called teasing size right? If you come to me and you want one of my M&Ms, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to have to think about it. <laughs> I'm going to have to think about it. You know why? Because there's seven in here. <laughs> That's why. Seven. And if you come to me and you ask me for, you, are you seriously asking me for one seventh of my stash? God himself only asked for one tenth of what he gives us. And you have come to me and you want one seventh of what I have. How rude. How arrogant are you? I might have to think about it. Maybe if I'm having a good day, if I'm feeling spiritual, I might give you one. Now what I have here, however, oh, this is the movie theater size. For $7, this can be yours as well, right? Now you come to me and you want one of these I might give you one because there's 57 in here. I counted, okay? So I've got this many, and you come, and you want one? Uh, I'll probably give you one. I'll probably give you one because I think I got enough. But what if? What if I got the one-pound bag, baby? Yeah. Oh, some of you are so, you're drooling. I can already see this. This is sad. You come to me, and I've got this one-pound bag with over... 500. You know how long it takes to count this? With over 500 of these heavenly chocolate goodies, you come to me and you want one, nine times out of 10, I'm going to give you one. I might even give you two. <laughs> nine times out of 10, I'm gonna, that 10th time, sorry, I'm just in a bad mood. It happens. Even the pastors, okay? I might do it. But what if? Oh, heavenly of heavenlies, what if? I could, oh, I know, right? Right? Oh, we should just dismiss right there. What if you come to me and I have a 10 gallon aquarium full of these, the candies of the gods, right here? I just, I just want to, oh, sweet. Dear Candies, if you come to me and I have this many, I'm probably going to give you one. Might even give you, you know what? I might even give you a handful. By the way, kids, do not come up and eat this because this was a hamster aquarium. <laughs> okay? Don't do that. Don't do that. If you want some, see me afterwards. I got some in the back, all right? You see what's happening here? This, this right here represents what we wish we had. God, if I just had more, I would serve you. I would give you just a little bit more. Church, pay close attention 
to what I'm about to tell you. This right here, you want to know what life is like when it's reset with Jesus? When we have the abundance he promises us, when he gives us all we need to meet other needs, because if he calls you to meet a need, then he will supply you to meet that need. Oh, well, now we're talking something totally different. You know what we're talking about? We're not talking about a 10-gallon aquarium. We're talking about God giving you the master key to the M&M factory. Oh, <laughs> right? The master key. Do you know how many M&Ms are made in one day at the master factory, the plant? 450 million. I didn't count those. 450 million every single day. Well, well that changes everything, Pastor. Because now I'm not just trying to respond. I'm actually searching for people to give them away to. I'll know you need them before you even know yourself. And that is the gospel. He equips us to do that. The one who gives us life. He said this in John 10, 10. He says, I have come that you may have life and may have it more abundantly. The one who provides. Man, you need M&Ms? He's got them all. You need resources to meet somebody's need? You need that stamina? You need that intensity? You need that passion? I am here to provide all that you need. Romans 8.32 blows my mind. I'm going to let you read it for yourself. It's right here, and it says this. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? This is incredible. All that you need to meet the needs that Jesus is calling you to meet is promised. What are you going to do about it? All the stamina, all the strength, all the determination, that's what we have in Christ. That's why we give. That's why we invest. That's why we serve. That's why we show up to follow Jesus' example. It's not to earn some return on investment. It's not to earn some fancy reward or some great thank you card or some speech. You're awesome. It's not about that at all. In fact, it's for one thing. One day, one day, you will hear the greatest words well done, good and faithful servant. Isn't that enough? Think about that. Well done. You let me reset your heart and your heart was pleasing to me. You let me reset your words and your words were pleasing to me. You let me reset your mind and your thoughts were pleasing to me. And then you asked me to surrender your hands to my lordship and you brought me glory. Well done, servant well done. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Wow. It truly is more blessed to give than receive. And that's what he's calling us to. Well done. That's our motivation. When we surrender our actions to him, he takes control. He changes everything and it'll blow your mind as to what he can accomplish through you. Let's pray about it together. Father, as we come to you today, we're asking you to reset our hands, take them, set them apart, Lord, make them holy for your service. Advance your glory, your fame. Take every aspect of our lives, God. Use it for your kingdom. Use it for your glory, for your fame. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name this morning. Amen. Amen. Keep fighting the good fight.